Hello everyone. So a while ago I made this video of a Rube Goldberg machine simulation and I got this question about it that says, can you explain the equations that go along with this Rube Goldberg machine? So if you haven't seen the machine yet, you can check out the link above. So in this video, I'm going to go over those equations and I'm assuming that those equations are going to be energy equations as of course I can go over motion or forces or I can even calculate momentum and conservation laws. And even I could calculate the de Broglie wavelengths of objects. But when I give this assignment to my grade 11 physics students, I specifically ask for energy transfers and transformations. So let's go over what those are. So let's start with energy transfers. An energy transfer is when an object transfers some of its energy to another object in, say, a collision. And then we have a transformation. So this is when one energy is transformed from one type to another type of energy. And you have different energies. You could have a kinetic energy, which is the energy of motion. You can have gravitational potential energy, which is a stored energy due to an object's position inside of a gravitational field. You can have elastic potential energy due to the stretching or compression of a spring. You can have thermal energy, and this usually comes about from friction, right? Friction creating heat. You can have radiant energy. Maybe um, you have a laser or something. And there's way more different energies that you can use there. But the most common ones you're going to see in a Rube Goldberg machine are going to be the first two, kinetic energy, the energy of motion, and gravitational potential energy, that energy of an object raised inside of a gravitational field. So in this Rube Goldberg, we automatically start with these two balls here that are in a gravitational field at a raised position. So they have gravitational potential energy. And you can calculate that energy with the equation mgh. Now h can be defined to have a height of zero at the ground level, or you can define h to be zero anywhere you want. Right? In this case, it might make sense to define h to be zero here, because this is where we're going to have an interaction. So these balls are going to fall. And we're going to get an energy transformation where gravitational potential energy is going to change into kinetic energy. And then it is going to hit this beam here and transfer some of that kinetic energy into the beam. So we're getting a kinetic energy transfer from one object into the other object. And that is going to transfer energy to the next object which will then transfer energy to the next object. And then this spills water everywhere, and that water also has gravitational potential energy, which then moves downwards, being converted into kinetic energy. So you can see these energy transfers and transformations. Now, as the water then falls into this sort of bucket, so to speak, uh, that kinetic energy is going to transfer into the kinetic energy of this lever. Now essentially this is rotational kinetic energy because it's going to start the lever rotating. Uh, but you don't usually learn about rotational kinetic energy in high school physics, so usually I just accept my students to say it's just uh, kinetic energy, which is good enough for an introductory physics course. And that kinetic energy you can always calculate with the equation 1 half mass times velocity squared. And then we have a whole bunch of energy transfers here. We got that domino effect. So kinetic to kinetic to kinetic and so on. And then again, the ball having um, a raised position in a gravitational field means it has some gravitational potential energy, which then continues to drop and drop as it gets transformed into kinetic energy. So you can see most of the energies here in a lot of the Rube Goldbergs that are done in an introductory physics course are these two energies here. Now you could say as an object moves, it creates friction, and that friction creates thermal energy. But in the case of this Rube Goldberg, for a lot of the objects, I actually removed friction. 
Uh, but of course, in the real world, um, you can't just simply remove friction. So thermal energy does exist, and you can say that as well. Um, we do have some elastic potential energy. So right here, we have a spring. So when this ball falls, right, it's converting or transforming gravitational into kinetic energy. And then it's going to go in here, pulling this down, but it's also going to stretch the spring. When you stretch the spring, it's also being converted into elastic potential. Now that's a grade 12 physics concept. Um, now that's a grade 12 physics concept. Uh, if you wanted to calculate it, elastic potential energy is one half kx squared, where x is your displacement from equilibrium nk is your spring constant or force constant measured in newtons per meter of the actual spring and you can actually change that force constant in this simulation to make it greater or lower depending on uh, how much force you want it to be required to actually change its position now over here the balls all of these balls here as they go down start to bounce quite a lot i did that by changing the elasticity of these surfaces you're going to get that energy transformation as it falls again going gravitational to kinetic energy but then every time it hits you will lose some energy normally uh, due to thermal energy or maybe deformation in the actual object but when i made the elasticity um, close to 100 percent that means we have almost no loss of energy to other forms and so your velocity immediately just reverses direction keeping the amount of kinetic energy roughly the same which is why you get these like huge bounces going on over here now thermal energy is um, also usually a grade 12 concept you can calculate it simply uh, with work being done by friction which would be kinetic friction or the force of kinetic friction multiplied by the displacement that it acts over and finally down here i just attached this little rocket engine which is constantly moving it's a fairly low force which is why this rod can hold it in place but then when this knocks over the rod um it's simply allowed to to raise in in a certain thrust uh, you can consider that work to be done because work is being done by that uh, thrust which is just again force times displacement so i hope this video helped and if you have any further questions, let me know in the comments.